Hoshi. Recorded live. Hello and good evening. Uh, this is the regular University of Eucadia talk show on all matters relating to Eucadia research, One Heaven. Uh, your host tonight, uh, my name's Franco Collins, and I welcome all those who are listening tonight live via talk show, Wednesday, the 31st of uh, August, 2011. You'll be able to hear this broadcast again through TalkShoe or through the archives on University of Acadia.info. That is uh, http um, forward slash university dot Acadia dot info. And before I get going, just remember always the material we're providing is a combination of research and insight. And whatever we speak about, please uh, consider it carefully and, and please don't consider it as direct legal advice. Always think about the material we speak about. Uh, always consider different opinions as well. Well, the format tonight is similar to what we do. For the first hour, I would like to cover some of the latest research and the follow-up from the most recent talk shoes. And then in the second hour, I look forward to your questions. Remember to have your questions answered. There are two ways. Either type in the word question in all caps and then the nature of your question, or you can press star, I believe it is, star or hash eight, and I will see that you're listed up in the queue, and I look forward to taking your question in order. Well, let me start, and the first thing I want to talk to you about tonight, we've covered it before, but I think it's appropriate to cover again, is this question of the different types of Eucadia trusts. What is a divine trust? What is a true trust as evidenced by the lifeborn record? And what are superior trusts? And there are questions around that too. Why, why have three trusts? And why does it appear to be so complicated? Why can't we simply have one trust? And how does this relate back to the trust system of the Roman system? So I want to cover that again because whilst we've spoken about it, I appreciate the material may not yet make it as clear as it needs to be. And I know a number of you still have questions and, and trying to get a handle on how that works. So Eucadia Trust is the first and, and main section I want to start about tonight. I want to bring you up to speed with the updates to the material that we've done on the Eucadia websites. And I'll be going to the homepage of one-heaven.org and showing you how we have update the material and set up the court sites. And tonight I'll go through and show you where that material is now for those that are coming on and looking and, and saying, where do I find the material on ecclesiastical deeds or where do I find the material on uh, forms of law or uh, land? And I also want to cover with you in these updates on the information, what we are going to do on the Eucadia public record and the Eucadia public notices because this system will be operational in literally in a matter of days and it's another reason why the court sites have been turned on now because we we have a system we have over 60 websites and behind the scenes we have a register a great register and that system is a very important part of the remedy that we in fact will be recording on our own international or global register system as much as anything that we are doing in their system. So I want to cover those things. I want to bring up to speed with the latest research on wills and I also want to cover the issue of the ecclesiastical deed poll and how it all fits together. And last but not least, with all of this, I want to answer a couple of questions that have come up during the week, particularly the ongoing question of the complexity of Eucadia and why we're doing what we're doing. It's fine to talk about specifics, but often these bigger questions are left unanswered or are not adequately answered. So I want to come back to that fundamental question of why are we doing this? Why, why are we doing what we're doing with Eucadia? It may seem obvious, but for people who come to it the first time, the information is well and truly overwhelming. So I want to cover that question of complexity. 
Well, there's a lot to cover in that first hour. Eucadia Trust, the updates to the sites, the upcoming uh, public record, the updates to wills and research and how ecclesiastical deeds fit in, and then, of course, this question of complexity. So let's get started, and we'll see that we can try and get through this in the first hour. Well, when you go to One Heaven, and now when you go to the court sites, and for those on the call, if you want a web page to reference as we speak, please go to one-heaven.org. And when you get there, just click on the image and you should come to the home page. And I ask you to refresh that page because the page has been updated. So when you do go to One Heaven and you read the covenant, and I hope if you do get the chance, I do hope that everyone on the call does take the time to read the covenant. If you want a PDF version, there is a PDF version on university.ukd.info and I will make a point of making sure that that PDF is available from the home page in an easy fashion to find as well. You look at the trusts and you see that there are different types of trusts. We speak about divine trust. We speak about true trust. And of course, we speak about superior trust. Now, for many people, trust law is relatively new. They may have heard about it from different people. And certainly there's no shortage of material now on the internet about trusts. So the first question people may, may well ask is, what is a divine trust? How is it formed? What is a true trust? How is it formed? What is a superior trust? And why so many trusts? Let's go through those questions one by one and explain their relationships. The Roman system which we call the Roman cult. And the reason we call it the Roman cult is that we are referring to a very, very small number of people who have usurped and hijacked a system that was founded with the best of intentions. And that's what we call the Roman cult. And we do that to distinguish it from the vast majority, the 99.999% of people who may identify themselves by the term Catholic, who may identify themselves uh, e even as lapsed Catholic because we do not refer to them. We refer to a very small number of people. Those people set up a system a thousand years ago and have spent centuries perfecting it. And in that system, what they have done is they have wholly and totally usurped what we believe are our divine rights. And one of the most controversial things that we raise on these talks and raise on a number of websites is the claim that this very small band of people, the Roman cult, and the connection to a series of families based out of Venice and Genoa and now spread out throughout the world, we variously describe as the parasites or the Magyar Khazar elite. In no, in no uh, way trying to defame people who have that kind of heritage, but a very small group of people like the Roman cult that usurp a greater body of people for their own end. But this group has effectively claimed not only that they own everything on this planet in terms of buildings, fixtures, money, in terms of corporations, but they have also claimed astoundingly to own our bodies, and indeed our souls. Now, on one side, we seek to rebut those presumptions, expose them, rebut them, and show that they are wholly untenable. But at the same time, we want to ensure that never again, as we have exposed this, never again will any group ever be able to claim that anyone that stands between you and the divine, your relationship with the universe is immutable, is absolute, and cannot be usurped. These are not my words. These are words of many, much, much better people than me who have come before us. 
not the least of which are some words in a book called the New Testament. So how do we ensure legally and lawfully using trust law and using law that underpins the entire present world today? How do we use those tools to ensure that no one can claim your spirit? No one can claim to stand between you and the divine. And we do that through the identification of the divine trust. And what the divine trust says is that the words that are written as sacred scripture, the words that speak of our dominion, of our rightful stewardship and heirship to the land, custodians and keepers as guardians and executors can be formalized into a formal trust structure so that the divine creator in making that known and having made it known in scripture is the grantor of the divine trust and that into that divine trust is placed the spirit and our divine person, which we may call our, our soul, we may call it many things, our spirit, is then the beneficiary of that divine trust. That entire apparatus is done without any religion being able to claim to be the administrators, without any group, cult, association, any historical group, family, anybody claiming to interfere in that process, including Eukadia. And so the divine trust is then merely a formality, a formalization of a promise, a belief, a truth, a divine right that has been there in most civilized societies from the very beginning. And we formalize it so that it can never be usurped again. Of course, if you want to usurp something, you don't formalize it. If you want to usurp something, you don't ensure that it can be protected. You leave it open. You leave it vague. And therefore it can be claimed. Or at the very least, it can be used to manipulate people. Well, that is ended in the covenant of one heaven. And so we are, through our divine person, the beneficiary of a divine trust. A trust administered in the spiritual realm with no physical, temporal, entity, capable of claiming to own, administer, any of those things. That is the purpose of the divine trust. Now we talk about the true trust. The same group of people we speak of that make the outrageous claims to speak on behalf of the divine, to interpose themselves between ourselves and the divine, to claim that they are God's emissaries, who then claim ownership or control of our souls, also claim our bodies. Now, for many people, this is less controversial. I don't know if it's less controversial, probably less difficult to comprehend the idea of slavery, the concept of voluntary slavery, of indebted slavery of slavery by virtue of status, all these things still continue embedded in their system today. And we've spoken about this. The concept of being called a pauper, the fact that your, your passport identifies the word P. It may not represent pauper, but it certainly represents peon, peonage. You owe a debt, and until that debt's paid, you are a slave to the creditor, creditors. That is very much alive in their system. There's plenty of evidence of that. And is that not a form of slavery? Of course it is a form of slavery. Debt slavery was an intrinsic part of Rome and it is alive and well today. We indeed are debt slaves and wage slaves in their system. And that's where they want to keep us. So they claim our body. That's why they do all this trickery about the live born record, the original, which we can't find, which they don't give to us. They do. 